God's word this morning comes to us from Esther chapter 6, verse 1 through 13. But I'm going to invite us to read verse 1 through 10 t- together. It's a bit longer than what we usually read together, but I believe when God's people come together to read God's word together that there is power. So I invite us to, like we always do at Christ Community Church, I invite us to stand together in body or in spirit so that we can honor God's holy word like the people of Israel did. And I invite us to read this uh, passage a bit longer, but I invite us to read this together in one voice. Ready, begin. That night, the king could not sleep, so he ordered the book of the Chronicles the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Bithana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. What honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this? The king asked. Nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. The king said, who is in the court? Now, uh, Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about impaling Mordecai on the pole he had set up for him. His attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. When Haman entered, the king asked him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Now, Haman thought to himself, Who is there that the king would rather honor than me? So he answered the king, For the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn and a horse the king has ridden, one with the royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honor and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Go at once, the king commanded Haman. Get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. Amen. You may be seated. Please join me in prayer once again as we ask the Lord to illuminate our hearts. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light for our path. Speak to us now, O Lord, as we pray. Speak to us, empower us, encourage us, comfort us, challenge us, O Lord. For this we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people say, Amen. The king had trouble sleeping that night. Normally, he had no problem falling asleep, but something was different that night. Was he worried? Was he worried about politics? Was he worried about his finances? Was he worried about his approval ratings? Was he worried about the queen's spontaneous request? Was he worried about what was to come with these so-called banquets that Queen Esther was planning? You take a step back, you can see that this was God's sovereignty at work, behind the scenes and in the unseen. Think about it. The king of all people had resources to receive and get whatever he wanted. He could have received the best entertainment and the best help to get him to fall asleep. But for some reason... But for some reason, and the children have said amen already, God orchestrated it in a way where he can hear his chronicles read to him. I don't know about you, but if I read a boring biography, I'd probably fall asleep pretty quickly no matter what. But what are the chances that the king's servant would pick out a book that talked about Mordecai's good deed? What are the chances that the servant would read about Mordecai saving the king from that assassination attempt in that specific time and that specific place? As he was listening to the chronicles being read, something caused the king to go, oh, did we ever honor him? Did we ever celebrate him? Did we ever recognize him? Because contextually, that's what you did. 
Rewards and punishments were so important and part of the DNA in the everyday life back then. So it was highly unusual that the guy who helped save the king's life from an assassination attempt to not be recognized. But imagine with me, church, what if Mordecai was actually recognized right when this had happened? Would the king respond and re react like this when he heard that story in his chronicles, in his biography? Probably not. And that's where many theologians use the phrase, God's delays are not God's denials. God's delays are not God's denials. Because, of course, Mordecai had probably suffered greatly. He probably suffered emotional distress as well in thinking that God did not care. But if you go back into the story, what are the chances that Haman walked in at that specific time? What are the chances that Haman walked in when the king be began to ponder what needed to be done to honor and celebrate Mordecai? What if it were another royal official? What if Haman walked in a couple hours later? Look at Psalm 33 with me. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Wow. Amen and amen. Amen. God is at work. There is, like we've been, as we've been studying through the book of Esther, we've already mentioned this multiple times. There is no direct mentioning of God, but there are so many indirect examples and evidence that God is clearly at work. In the visible and the invisible, in the seen and the unseen, God didn't have to be mentioned for him to be working. So here we are. Haman walks in. The king then invites him into his living quarters. And like I shared last week, pride for Haman is going up, 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 and up. <laughs> he said, oh, all right. <laughs> he probably did what I just did with his, all right, I, 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 I get to go into the king's living quarters. All right, here I come. Look who I am. The king asked Haman, what do you think should be done for someone that the king wants to honor? He probably did a little bit of uh, this again and go, all right, he's trying to honor me. All right, here we go. Haman thought the king was talking about him. I want you to look carefully how Haman responds to that question that the king asked. If you have your Bibles open or your, uh, the scriptures available on the screen in front of you as well, verse 7 through 9. For the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn and a horse that the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and horses be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honor and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Now, let's pretend we're in a big, large group Bible study right now, right, church? What's a commonality that we see in that response? What's a commonality? We see the word king, right? Have them bring a royal robe, right? So anything and everything that revolves around the king, right? Can I get a nodding of heads? Right? Do we, we have this common theme of something and anything and everything that has to do with being a royal, right? So if you take a moment and imagine Haman being the one to get all the rewards, getting all that he's saying he wants, on one hand, the people in the nations may have thought, wow, the king had already handpicked a successor. Looks like he's the successor. If you were the citizens of the nations during that time and you see Haman be marched around with all that royal crest and royal hoopla, you'd probably think, oh, wow, I guess that's the successor. But on the other hand, in other words, you can also interpret it this way. Haman flat out was saying, I want the crown. 
give me the crown. You see where I'm going with this? Haman's just pretty much saying it out loud. He, 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 may, he may think that he was beating around the bush, no, but he's saying, oh, I want the crown. Haman was showing his true colors to the king. Proverbs 29 teaches us pride brings a person low, <laughs> but the lowly in spirit gain honor. So what happens? How would the king respond? And I love, I love this story because the king responds like this in verse 10. Well, then go at once. The king commanded Haman, get that robe, get that horse, and do just as you have suggested for who? Mordecai. Ooh. Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. And this is where, if I had my Bible open with you right now, I'd be underlining it over and over again. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. I'm not the one that said it. You said it. So you do it. Now, first of all, there seems to be some confusion. If you're me and you're reading this for the first time, you'd probably be like, uh, didn't the king sign the edict to pretty much annihilate the Jews? Yet he's trying to honor a Jew? He agreed to the genocide, the annihilation of the Jews, but now this? Oh, how the tides have turned. One day the king was an enemy of the Jews. A few weeks later, he's now getting ready to honor one of the leading Jewish citizens. Now, can you imagine the kind of emotions Haman, this prideful, prideful man, was going through? Because contextually, you can't talk back to the king. So as much as he wants to talk back, and as much he's, he needs to bite his tongue. Because contextually, you just don't talk back to the king. I think of it this way. Have you ever tried talking back to your parents? <laughs> I've tried, and it's bad news bears. You just don't. You just don't talk back to your parents. No matter what culture you're in, no matter what country you're in, right? I've traveled to many places on missions trips, right? But no matter where you are, there's this pretty much unwritten rule, or maybe written, across the nations. It's a, it, it transcends nature, nations and culture. You don't talk back to your parents. You just don't. And I think of it this way. Contextually, Haman knew he can't talk back to the king, so he's like, that's probably what's going on right now in his heart and in his mind. So Haman probably had to bite his tongue. And like I said, the end of verse 10, do not neglect anything you have recommended. And pretty much the words that came out of his mouth are now thrown right back at his face. Ooh. So let's review. This guy, Haman, hated Mordecai and wanted nothing with Mordecai because Mordecai didn't bow down to Haman. So let's review. Now, Haman had to go out to the king's gate. He had to get Mordecai. He had to dress Mordecai. Bring him into the palace, dress him in the king's robes. And after putting Mordecai on the king's horse, Haman had to lead that horse throughout the city and shout and proclaim, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. And then after making his rounds, Haman had to go back to the palace and take care of the royal garments that Mordecai had on, had to press, you know, do, 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 do the little ironing and do everything like a servant would. I don't know about you, but that sounds humiliating, <laughs> right? Or better yet, oh, how the irony. Hmm. Haman serving as a servant for, for Mordecai, commanding people, the people on the outside, to bow down and honor Mordecai. The one thing that Mordecai wouldn't dare to do for Haman, but now Haman had to tell others to do for Mordecai. Wow. But I want you to look carefully with me at verse 13. Because of all the verses here, at least here in chapter 6, I feel like this is the most important verse that sticks out for all of us. Verse 13, his advisors and his wife, Zeresh, said to him, 
Since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. This is almost like God is giving Haman an opportunity to repent and experience redemption. Because think of it this way. How can a pagan advisor and the pagan wife of an evil man tell Haman that he doesn't stand a chance. Because if you're all evil and if you're all pagan, you're probably going to be st- scheming. All right, so what do we do now? We got to seek revenge. Let's get vengeance. We don't see that in verse 13. <laughs> They're telling Haman, you don't have a chance. And it's not because, oh, hey, you're weak. You don't have a chance. But they're flipping it around, flipping the perspective. They're saying, you don't have a chance because Mordecai is of God's chosen people. No matter how pagan or evil they are, they were recognizing in that moment that Mordecai was of God's chosen people. Do you not see how deep this is, the meaning of this interaction, right? Let's look into a couple verses from Proverbs that I believe helps emphasize what we're learning here through this passage in Esther. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 8, the righteous person is rescued from trouble and it falls on the wicked instead. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 30, there is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. Amen and amen. Church, God's big picture, we shared this already the other week, will always revolve around God. God's big plans will always revolve around God, not on us. God's success in your life will always revolve around his standard of success and his definition of success, not ours. Church, the Lord will always prevail in your life. The Lord's plans will never be defeated. Something we can learn in addition to these couple verses in Proverbs is this. Our God is a God who will always give that opportunity for forgiveness and redemption. That's the kind of God we have. That's the kind of God where we're worshiping this morning. God desires for sinners to turn from their sins and be saved, that he would even do that for Haman through his unbelieving wife, through his unbelieving advisors. There, he, God is still orchestrating and working through that situation. Giving the opportunity. Saying, are you going to come back? Are you going to turn around from that sin? Are you going to turn around and start walking down that pride mountain and come back to life? God desires for sinners to repent. So God even used a pagan advisor, a pagan spouse, to give an opportunity for Haman, of all people. But you see, that's the powerful thing of God remembering. No matter how much we see God's people falter, no matter how much we see people not be there physically or spiritually where God wants them to be, deliverance will come. Vindication will come. Justification will come. God's people will be delivered. God's people will be delivered. This past week, if you're looking at the news, it seems like there's just disappointment, discouragement, frustration, division. I mean, it's not pleasing looking at the news. It's not good for your mental health and emotional health the more you look at the news. And when I talk with people, especially in the community, especially at, at, at my son's pickup uh, and drop-off because I've ended up uh, befriending many of his uh, classmates' parents, and I don't hold it back and say, I'm, I'm a pastor of that church next to the library. They start asking me questions like I'm their pastor, and I'm like, uh, maybe you should come out on Sunday at 10.30 a.m. But they would be like, hey, what do you think, man, about all of this junk that's happening from the city? What about the, all this, this, and that? And I'm like, well, you know what? <laughs> the, Lord's, the Lord's will will prevail. And I, I, I know, I know, I know. They don't give me all that religious stuff. But, like, you know, what do you think? I, like, I, I don't have to tell you what I think because I believe that the Lord will prevail. Scripture even th- teaches us the things of this world will pass away, but heaven will remain. 
Amen. You see, God's people will be delivered. Justification will be here. Vindication will be here. Deliverance will come. As I was preparing this message, message I, 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 come, I usually uh, come into the sanctuary uh, early on uh, in the week as well as Sunday mornings to try to pray. And I've been praying a lot more lately, and, and I th- reflected on, on when I began ministry. I accepted the call and began ministry about 12 and a half years ago. But many of you know, I wanted nothing to do with ministry because I saw the toll it took on my family growing up. I had people accuse my father of things that I can't even say from this pulpit. My father, because of all that ministry stress, even collapsed and had a heart attack. And and the doctors, I still remember being in the, 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 the room, the hospital room, where they said, Reverend Lee, you would have died if you were not as young as you were. He was 42. I still remember vividly, reverently, you probably would not have survived if you weren't, you, if you weren't as young as you were. So I wanted nothing to do with ministry. I did not want to be a pastor. I wanted to be a baseball commentator. There were times, as I thought back, as I've been praying, reflecting upon these past 12 years, there were many times I wanted to throw in the white towel and quit. There were many times I thought I was not good enough as a pastor. I didn't know the Bible enough. I wasn't compassionate enough. I was too rigid. I was too strict or what have you. And there were many times I just thought I was not good enough and I just want to quit and be a stay-at-home dad and take care of the kids which is not a bad thing to do. And there were times when I just tank, which just felt tanked, exhausted, spent, and I had nothing in the tank, and I was just, ugh, I'm tired. And there are times, even in the past five years, I have to admit, but with the pandemic, I wanted to give up on ministry as a whole. But as I was preparing this message, God spoke to me and gave me the words, God remembers. That's why I titled the message that way. God remembers. And as I was preparing this message, I thought or tried to put myself in the shoes of Mordecai. And I thought, wow. Mordecai probably felt what I felt in that moment when I heard the word God remembers. God remembers the call that he put on my life. God remembers the covenant and his promise for me. But it dawned on me that it's on me to remember that over and over again, that God remembers. Who are we to forget? See, the world may knock us down. The world may cause us to think that we are up against a wall. The world may think that there is uh, dying churches and Christianity is a dying breed and people aren't going, you know, walking away from the faith. But at the end of the day, through the story of Esther, Mordecai, and Haman, we are reminded that indeed God remembers. God knows. We may fight one too many battles. Some of you may be even fighting one too many battles as we speak. But in his perfect timing, God is faithful. His perfect will, God's people will be delivered. Our Lord will prevail. See, this past week, and I'll end with this. This past week, I, I, there was one day where I was having a very just rough day. Just, it was just, and w- in church, you know, like sometimes you have one of those emotional days where you just, man, it's just not one of those days. Then I got a phone call from someone who uh, is part of our church family asking for forgiveness of something that happened over five months ago. And I was like, huh? Oh, and, and that, that church member said, hey, you know, I just it convicted my heart that I needed to ask for your forgiveness because when you called five months ago, I didn't want to pick up your call. 
and I was busy doing other things, so um, I just didn't bother picking up your call, but it bugged me, so I, I will call to ask for your forgiveness. I was mind blown. Because <laughs> God was teaching me, once again, that God remembers that we are held in God's covenant promise. And to think what Mordecai was going through, wow. God never left him. And as I was hearing, you know, interacting with that church member, I was, hey, you know, it's been over five months. It's all good. Don't worry. You know? Back of my head, I even forgot I had called five months ago. And, you know, I'm but he said, no, it doesn't matter if it was five minutes ago or five months ago. Please forgive me. Church, God works through people that you don't expect. God works through situations that you don't expect. God works in ways that we can't expect. Why? Because it's not us t- on us to remember. It's on God who always remembers for us. Why? He is faithful. God never left Mordecai. But more importantly, God never left you. Let us pray.